Welcome to the Elevate Edge AI podcast, where we talk everything AI, automation, and marketing. On today's episode, we have Helena and my good friend, Mark, who is the CEO and founder of Prompt Advisors. How you doing, Mark? Do you want to give us a little bit more uh, background into, into sure. what you're doing currently and, and how that Absolutely. all started? Because I know you have a big story in, in terms of... Uh, journey education and previous businesses and stuff like that so that'd be cool for sure sounds good so um i've been in the ai and analytics space for the past 10 years uh right now i'm a data science manager by day and then by night i'm an ai agency owner for the past year and a half um i initially started in hr analytics or it's called people analytics now spent four or five years there I basically graduated from finance way back when, when I was obsessed with investment banking, realized I did not have the personality for it. And I quickly took a sales job when I first graduated undergrad and with the sole intention of begging the HR person to give me a shot at the analytics team for the following summer. So I did that for six months, even though I hated talking on the phone, I hated talking to clients and I hated getting rejected. So those were like the trifecta of my friction points to get to my first analytics job. Once I got that, um, four years passed, came pretty adept, worked some, with some really good companies to build their HR analytics and people analytics, and then did a master's in AI, where I ended up specializing in natural language processing, which has become very, very handy, especially where we're at today. Um, basically, I was building really bad versions of GPT-2 models, so I was forced to learn how to be really good at math and be really good at coding, even though I wasn't. And I was self-taught at a coffee shop for a few years. Um, once I got over that hurdle, I ended up being a data scientist at a couple of startups, uh, worked at Amazon for a year and a bit as an AI and BI engineer. And then I landed where I'm at right now, which is at an AI pharmaceutical company where we build um, basically a matchmaking tool for sales reps of drugs and pharmaceuticals and healthcare providers that could benefit from those. So that's my day job. And by night, I'm doing this AI agency. So that's kind of my TLDR. Awesome. How come you, you're, because I know you're killing it with your agency. How come you still work in the full-time job? I have mental rules of thumb for when I'm going to sunset my career for good. But I'm hoping that this will be my last job. I'm here because I actually like the company and I like my team. Um, so when that interest wanes to a point where I feel like I'm not delivering the hundred percent, then the next regression will be to go at this full time. But given my 42 prior failures, also, I have some trauma from, uh, not being a successful entrepreneur. So I really want to make sure I'm actually right about this and not just lucky, uh, a few sequential times so that I have that confidence to keep going. Mm -hmm. So, um, can you tell us a little bit about how you got started and how did you get your first client? Sure. Yeah. So from an AI perspective, uh, I started off on a platform called Fiverr and mm -hmm. I just offered anything I could think of at the time. So I started my agency three days after ChatGPT came out. Cause I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to make money off of this, but I know if I ever have a shot, this is my chance. Like my nerd moment is here. So let me just take advantage of it. So uh, my first gig or ad was for prompt engineering because for the first three months from like November, 2022 to like early February for 2023, the name of the game is, Oh, get my prompt or here's a special secret prompt or buy my hundred prompts. And I noticed that the average Joe creating those prompts had no idea what they were doing. were getting lucky with their outputs while I could actually understand why some things were working and not working. So Mm -hmm. Prompt engineering was my way to getting my first clients, which were super, super low ticket. I offered my time for almost nothing because even though I have the street cred for it, when it comes to the marketplace, nobody cares. It's really about what are, what's your social proof? What have you done before and what can you do for me? And having more of that academic mindset, beating the business mindset, I had to really get adept at how do I package this in a way to sell it? Um, so within a month, I was selling a few clients on very low ticket prompt engineering. Four or five months later, that ended up developing into building apps and web apps for these clients, chatbots when that was like all the rage for like three months last year. And then beyond that, it's been really a combination of uh, fine tuning LLMs, which is basically 
fancy wording for making like a, a large language model that has like a master's and everything, a PhD at one thing. So that's one thing I really focused on. And then corporate training. So four key services. And ever since then, it's been a compound. So as soon as I did more Fiverr, they ended up calling me back to be like a master's of AI in like one of the categories that ended up getting more exposure. And then I ended up uh, meeting Lee Motley from the AAA agency. So that gave me some more exposure. And obviously being in the Discord with uh, with Mike as well, definitely facilitated things. Amazing. So can you go into more about, you know, the services that you're seeing um, that that clients are asking for, um, you know, in 2024 and, and uh, beyond? Because like chatbots are had their moments and uh, it's, it's still popular, but it's kind of weaning. Um, so can you talk about like the top requests that you're getting at your, your agency from clients right now? Yeah, so you'd be surprised. So I'd say there's a bifurcated answer to that. Um, yeah. there's, two, there's, there's two sections of people. There's people that have money right now and mm-hmm. feel like, okay, now it's finally time for AI or I've been ignoring it for so long because we were doing well financially and maybe we still are, but we really just want to supercharge ourselves chatbots all the low ticket solutions or all the very low level solutions are super popular with a cohort of folks we're talking even private equity are interested in basic ai tools because they have so much time invested in their thing that they haven't looked outside of that so even anything in chat gpt like the fact that you can copy paste an image and it can read it that to them is like mind-blowing that's how like out of the game they are Mm -hmm. that's like section one section two are the people that have been using chat gpt using all the tools building custom things for themselves. And they're looking to step it up to the next level in terms of how do I build now AI agents that can start to take portions of the admin tasks of my workforce? How do we expedite our market research plans? How do we kind of basically 10x our workforce without actually 10xing headcount? That's really the trend with that second cohort of folks. Yeah. Yeah. That's, That's exactly what we're seeing as well. And I mean, there's just so much power in, in kind of agents and that kind of multi-step prompt, like multi-step prompt kind mm-hmm. of uh, framework mm-hmm. and using custom knowledge and things like that. Um, I still think there's a big use for 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 chatbots that are for people and like sure. it's see it, it is weaning a little bit. They're just getting more complex. Mm-hmm. kind of what we're yep. saying like they're still there there's still, still a good use for them but it's not just like a knowledge like a question and answer type thing anymore yeah there's, like, no there to be more stuff there's more automations in the chatbots like connect yes happier and make so that, that these chatbots can actually take actions right absolutely so like a lily in the conversation today with two prospects where one of them um I showed them the tool called Relevance AI. I showed them what custom GPTs could do. And they literally said, I have 100 employees. I'm not buying a chat GPT account for each one of them. Knock that down. This Relevance thing hasn't been along like, for long enough. I don't trust it. Okay, that's knocked down. So now we're talking about which chatbot builder do they want to test this agent for all their franchises in the nutrition space. So some who are less familiar with these fancy tools want something very like fixed that they're familiar with that they can hold on to. So I'm seeing it as a guardrail for some people to pony up to be able to have the confidence to do that experimental thing. That's one other thing I wanted to just point out there. Right, yeah. right. So when so with your clients, I mean, in terms of like, are you going through the tools you're using with them or are you just like, because we go more of the, the route of like, because we're using a lot of custom code and things like that. Like we go the route of like, what do you want the final outcome to be? Mm-hmm. And then, like the tool bit doesn't matter. So, like, they don't want to know about that. Like, they 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 tell us they don't know. They don't want to know about that. They just want a final outcome. Interesting. Like, that's okay. Exactly how they want it. So, like, even if it comes down to like building like a custom interface or something like Bubble, just so we can deploy like an agent onto that, then we'll do that. Um, so what do you like when you're managing that process, are you handing over solutions? Are you kind of still managing that for them or how's that work? How's that work? I have a very different way of doing things. And by way, like disclaimer, I'm not saying this is the right way or the way that you 10 X your agency. I just, I'm doing it the way that I feel the most comfortable. Um, I show everything that I do. I kind of take behind the curtain, every client, even if they don't want to hear it, 
and I walk them through what I'm doing. Why do I do that? When I give them that final quote, a lot of times they have trauma from other developers, agency houses that just make up numbers out of thin air, look at the market cap of the company and just throw the highest number they can and just try. Yeah. When I walk them through the justification of here's three different paths we can take, don't worry about like the details, but this is what this tool does. And like, as if you're five years old, when they mm -hmm. have that hyper clarity, when we get to the offer stage, it's purely about money at this point and budget. It's not about lack of understanding, not about lack of trust. Um, and the way I do it is like, if you want to go with this very low level solution now, you already know what sophisticated looks like. So it's like a natural upsell is already in place because you know that I promised you if you went with option C, I could give you the world. But you want to start with A because you're scared, no problem. So I like to do it that way because you know that if we invest more time and money, that that's very highly correlated with the quality of your output and the quality of your solution. So that's kind of my strategy. Yeah, I mean, we, we do that. So we workshop and we'll go through the possibilities and yeah. we'll like go through their business and do that workshop and basically make a list of like what can be done. Mm -hmm. And then we'll, but we won't like be like, oh, this is the tool you need to know about all the tool and everything. Right. But it's like more about the solution that could be that we can offer. Right. Uh, so we do, the, it's pretty much the same thing. It's just not running them through a load of tools that I don't really care about. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, we'll have that list and then we'll start with something that they either have already said they want or something that is kind of the, the least friction to implement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we'll do another workshop after that, or then we'll move on in phases. You don't want to just go in and put in like 50 solutions into a business because it's just going to cause so much friction. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, the way that we do things is like start with something it's a little bit more basic and yep. then second phase, third phase, fourth phase. And then we uh, typically offer kind of like a consulting package with that. And yep. then with that, then they're able to kind of add on solutions when they need it. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a hundred ways to approach it, obviously. Of course. Um, I think, I think the way you're doing it though is, is much more scalable for those folks that don't want to know the devil in the details and they just want the outcome tomorrow uh, for a reasonable price. And then, want you there around in case anything breaks. Like that's the perfect model, right? Yeah. For sure. Cool. For sure. So um, Mark, what niches have you been noticing that um, are going into AI a lot? Like when you were um, more specifically, like as you were starting your AI agency, uh, mm -hmm. did you did you go after a specific niche or were you, you know, like I'll take any client that I can find? Like, how did you make yourself stand out, basically, in the crowd? Sure. Um, so I started off, and for the most part, I am still um, anti-niche and I'm anti-focus because okay. I've been humbled. I've been humbled by the industry to know that really interesting solutions are needed in, in use cases that I've never even imagined that are actually very interesting for me. So for me, like, interest is also part of my agency. If I'm passionate about a problem... I will go the whole nine yards and I will build something so good that it stands on its own two feet. So with that, I've let the the interest and passion just take me. So sometimes it's real estate. Sometimes I'm working with pharmaceutical. Sometimes I end up working potentially with uh, major sports teams um, behind the scenes. So anti-niche, where I'm starting to give some more love to is pharmaceutical because also my my day job's in pharma, so I understand how many inefficiencies are in that in neighborhood. Um, real estate, and mm -hmm. then chains. Could be a chain of anything. Could be a chain of supplement stores. Could be a chain of mm -hmm. gyms. When you get into the chain game, you can build one solution that you sell infinitely to different franchises and franchisors. So the monthly recurring revenue opportunity is pretty nice in those business models. But I don't care about which industry those businesses lie. Right. Can you talk about a little bit about the use cases that you're seeing in pharmaceutical, um, real estate, and like what are what are these business owners using AI for? Sure. So um, real estate, it's 100% creating listings, creating simulation tools. This is the coolest thing that I'm working on right now, where uh, we're creating a tool that an agent can practice negotiating. Uh, with a wholesaler for a piece of property and kind of logging their results on where they started like 
stumbling. And it's kind of like a voice to text where they can kind of act like they're talking to the person and see where their weaknesses are and their arguments and their uh, comebacks and how they should lowball or not lowball. So that's one use case with real estate. It's more so how do we now optimize face-to-face -face communication since they already can use the real estate listing GPTs that you can make all the content stuff already. So how do you take it to the next level? Uh, pharma is very much experimental research. So tons of papers have been coming out about companies discovering brand new antibiotics based on loading hundreds of papers and different sequences of DNA. So I'm helping some pharma companies just start put together the foundations of how do you embark on that type of research and how do you like set yourself up for success? So that's more advanced machine learning, large language model stuff, where it's much more theoretical, but that's what they want to start delving into. Um, and then when it comes to chains, I'm finding it's really about how do I get all my franchisees to not bother me about things like what is my franchise fee? Uh, what is our stake at the end of the year look like? What's our policy for labor? All these things. So I'm finding people that want to buy back their time through automating that time. Absolutely. And can you go into a bit more depth on how are you building these tools? Like, let's take the real estate one as an example. That's pretty interesting. You're building um, a simulation that people can use for negotiation. Can you kind of like walk us through like the process you're taking to think of that from a technical perspective and, you know, the tools you're using? And sure. Yeah. Sure. I go from um, ugly solution to pretty solution. An ugly solution to me is like, I literally write a Python script that uses like, I don't know, literally uh, open AI in the middle of it to just like power that conversation and you just like write your response to it. And that's like V1 that can get up and running in three to five days. Okay. We like that. We like kind of the style of that. Cool. Um, do you guys want to go custom codes route or do you want to build it through a third party tool that you can access after this engagement is done? Okay. You want low code tool? Here's like four options. Let's say we do relevance. Now we're going to take my Python script, import it there add some stuff in the knowledge base, create a little front end out of it. Cool, that's V2, less ugly, usable. People can start testing it. Oh, now you really like it, but you want all your branding on it. Okay, you don't want this on relevance anymore. You want this in-house in your kind of uh, internal resource hub. Cool, we can take what we built here and that's our Figma for building this full scale web app solution. So I, I de-risk with them and I de-risk for myself. So I don't like invest too much time before they come and say, this is not what we want. So that's kind of how I scale that type of solution. So you, so you start off by making almost like an MVP and yes. then going to a low code or no code tool like relevance. Is there any other tools I use? Really? Uh, just like Mike said, bubble, really good one that I use. Just It's really good for conceptualizing. I don't like the prettiness of it as much, but it's, it's good for that. Um, flow wise, ton, tons of little tools similar to that. Um, mm -hmm. And beyond that, yeah, we go into custom code. And mm -hmm. I usually call it the MLP. I learned that from Amazon. It's the only thing I learned from Amazon. Minimum lovable product. So we build something that when they interact with it, they're like, yeah, this is awesome. The response are great, but it's super ugly. I know it's super ugly. Uh, it'll take another like 20 hours to make it something usable. So I scale with that so that we're holding hands across the way. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I mean, we, yeah, we definitely take a similar approach. I mean, it's, yeah. If it's a big build, it kind of has to be done. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, I like that. I like that approach a lot because yeah, building something and spending two, three months on or two, Absolutely. three weeks even, and then them turning around saying they don't like it. Yeah. That is uh, definitely a problem for sure. So it, it doesn't come from uh, ingenuity. It comes from trauma. I've, I've done the two, three month build where they come and where there's disputes and, we're not happy and things get ugly. So I reverse engineer, how could I have avoided this mess to begin with? Yeah, I've, I went up, I mean, obviously I've been in marketing for like 10 years and <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's not exactly the same, but we have had like, I've also had like big burns in that. Where we've <laughs> over invested in like hiring multiple people and mm. invest a lot into a project for the client to turn around and, say so, yeah we don't want it anymore basically <laughs> and take them back yeah worst feeling ever <laughs> yes <laughs> certainly is not only that i think it's a big trend that we're noticing in general towards moving into no code tools and it's good because it's allowing people who don't even know how to code to also participate um 
And so we're noticing like product life cycles just keep getting shorter and shorter and shorter. It used to take like six to 12 months and a team of devs to create software. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, you can just create one in a weekend, um, you know, from yeah. your notes, right? So it's just, it's such a big shift, you know? Yeah, that's an awesome remark, uh, Helena, because I also say that it's not just the product life cycle that's scaled down, the solution life time has also scaled down. So the way I look at the industry right now is it's a series of arbitrage windows. If tomorrow GPT-5 comes out and now it can process video, all of a sudden there's going to be a new build for something that was never possible before that's now possible. And that will be the rage for the next quarter. And then the next part is, oh, wow, now you can get an agent to actually build a product end-to-end, -end, you know, a POC for you. Now I don't have to build MVPs anymore. I write a prompt that builds a POC for me. So yeah. it, it's on us. It's, the onus is on us as agency owners to keep up with everything because we always have to be aware of what is the path of least resistance right now. Because a year from now, it was hard enough to like, be a genius to come up with how do I get around an 8K context window for ChatGPT. That made you a genius. Now that's not even like a consideration anymore. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny you say that because literally right before this call, I was going through all of my old notes. And <laughs> I had all these ideas from a year ago of like just things to build. Like some were really big, like web apps, some were like just like smaller solutions. Mm -hmm. And when I made all those lists, I didn't know how to build them. Now when I now when I looked at the list, I even said to Elena, I was like, we can build this so easily now. But like a year ago, I was like, I have no idea how to build this, but I kind of know it's possible. Yeah. But I don't know exactly how. Now I look at it and I know exactly how to build it. It's amazing. So, yeah. yeah. It's just like keeping your finger on the pulse on things is is so essential with this. And I think that's important for even if you're not an AI agency and you're just a business or a business owner or whatever, like having some kind of pulse on it uh, just to know what's happening is essential because I think there's a lot of people kind of putting AI, a lot of businesses putting AI kind of like sweeping it under the carpet and kind mm -hmm. of ignore it. Um, I'm also noticing people that are kind of anti-AI as in they like, yeah, just don't like it at all. So, we, I mean, we had this discussion on the last podcast, but I, I'll say again, I don't understand the anti-AI side, but uh, yeah, what's your, what's your experience with that? Um, I've had, just give me one, I've had tons of pushback um, from internal employees in enterprises where I've tried to build very innocent tools that were not meant to replace any jobs. It was literally meant to be a repository where they could find their answers more easily for their customer support questions they're dealing with, but mm -hmm. tons of friction from employees that are fearful of the repercussions of this technology. Execs that are more so old school in the sense of we made money just fine. We made relationships just fine before this, and we can continue to do so without it. So it's a bit of, in a way, some hubris to the technology in terms of like what it can do and how quickly it can do something just as well as a trained employee. And then you have the super early adopter. I want it now. I like want to push it so far. What is the best thing I can get from this? What is the best prompt? What is the best tool? What's the best API? Like they're so on it. So in this way, like I'd say there's three different avatars when it comes to resistance or, you know, receiving it pretty well in terms of like AI adoption. Right. And how do you deal, like when you're going into an organization, um, how do you deal uh, from the human aspect, right? Like it's not just about building that technology, but also getting people to adopt to that change. So how do you deal with the people who are really resistant and really don't want to use um, that tool? So this is interesting. Sometimes I've made a tool dumber than I could make it on purpose so that it could have enough flaws where mm -hmm. someone could look at it and test it and be like, oh, I can't answer this edge case. Even if I really tried, I could probably do it in like, two days if I focused on it, but I've purposely not invested that time. So it looks, looks a bit more fragile. So there's more acceptance because we're like, okay, it helped me with these 70% 70 70 cases, but when it comes to these complicated convoluted cases, that's me. No one else can do that. That's my expertise. 
So it's sometimes a piecemeal, if anything, a Trojan horse approach to integrating AI into an organization like that. So, so actually purposely having some bugs in it, like we're just making it uh, not as perfect as it should be. That's interesting. Yeah. I actually learned that from a mentor who worked at AWS. Um, yeah. Search and Amazon is actually 20 to 30% more accurate than it actually is on the app. They were scaring so many users that they had to dumb down the recommendation system that when you buy something, it recommends like four or five products so like you may also like, or people that have purchased this have also liked. It yeah. used to be bang on. And they actually had to dumb it down on purpose because there's mm -hmm. some odd creepy reception about oh like how did you know that i'm dealing with this skincare issue i've never bought something like that it just yeah. they were able to do that like for like comparison and look alike audience kind of analysis so that i always remember and i try to apply it when i get that pushback that's really interesting that's yeah, really i've interesting. never heard that before it's crazy there you go nugget of the day <laughs> that's a very good nugget of the day i've heard uh, many more nuggets so it's a good <laughs> add it to the list Awesome. So I know that AI agents are becoming more and more popular. Can you kind of walk us through, like on the high level, how those are built for people who are interested? Sure. Uh, are we talking low code or or custom? Because that's two different beasts. Uh, both. Like, let's do low code first, and then custom. Sure. Low code is pretty straightforward. It's typically composed of give me instructions on what I'm supposed to do. Give me the context in plain English. Mm -hmm. empower with me with additional context that will un niche my understanding, aka knowledge base, PDF, files, CSVs, ideally pre-process said files. So it's dumbed down to a point where it's unbelievably difficult to misconstrue meaning or context, meaning you take file, process file to text file, turn that to like an FAQ document or structure in a way where it's unbelievably easy to find a like for like match if you search for something. And if you want to get fancy, connect me to APIs or automations using Zapier and Make. That in a nutshell is an agent. Instruction, custom knowledge that's optimized for it, and the ability to talk to APIs or backends that otherwise wouldn't be able to. So you're just saying it's like a custom GPT, basically. On steroids in some cases, yeah. Yeah. Um, quick question there. So how are you cleaning up that data? Because that's one problem that we run into a lot. So if we got like thousands of um, transcripts or files, um, it's quite hard for a machine to learn that. Um, so how are you doing the data processing and cleaning that up so that it's learning the right uh, information? Uh, also with the transcripts, you know, there's when you're using AI to transcript something, you know, it's not perfect, right? So, and if you, you're feeding the, then feeding the LLM something that's not perfect and it doesn't learn perfectly. So how do you deal with that issue? For sure. Step one, never promise 100% accuracy. That's step one. Uh, usually the best you can get is like 80 to 85% accuracy and you will have a margin of error unless you have like one file. If you're dealing with thousands, you're always going to have a, an error bar. So if that's understood, that's step one. Step two, my methodology is I've written a script that I buried myself in my basement to write for one week that I use for pretty much everything. Um, upload files, if they're PDFs or any other file or doc file, it breaks everything down to a apples to apples, dot text file. So that takes away all metadata uh, because sometimes PDFs have images and those images have metadata they get misconstrued and jumbled in with the additional text on a page by page basis. So imagine you have like a hundred page PDF, there's 30 pages of metadata that with your naked eye, you don't see, but the AI sees. So that really plays around with accuracy. So step one, all text files. Step two, turn every text file into an FAQ using the perspective of the audience. So in this case, if I'm doing this to create a marketing bot to give me recommendations for how I should market my business, I will write in a prompt, an agent, um, go through this file, and assuming that you are an expert marketer, come up with FAQs that would be of interest to you and your business given X niche and Y focus. And it would go through that file, start coming up with FAQs. That's number step number two. Step number three, I go back through my new FAQ file that I've made into one file out of thousands. So I have one file that's like 100 pages. Go through and add 
five categories of tags. So come up with five tags for this kind of data, add an anchor tag to every single FAQ. So now there's a extra piece of metadata that I'm making to throw on top of that data. And then finally, um, come up with a title tag for every single question that corresponds to that category and, and add a suffix to that FAQ question. So I keep adding more and more ways to give hints to the AI, hey, pick me in terms of vector, pick me to serve to the user as your response. Mm, so for listeners who don't know, can you quickly, I know it's a tough topic, but explain what a vector database is for people who don't. <laughs> It's only the, it's only difficult if you want to make it difficult. Uh, my expertise is I dump things down because I have to dump things down for, for myself. So if I say, how's it going, Helena? That's a vector. That could be represented by a vector of negative 1, 1, 2.5, and 3, right? So those numbers could represent that sentence. If I said, how's your day going, Helena? Helena's still in there. How is still in there. So those two small little words are still one and negative two, whatever I called those before. A vector database is hundreds of these sentences translated into numbers, all with corresponding, what's called an embedding. An embedding is when you take language and you translate it into a language that computers speak, which is are those numbers. When you have a thousand of those vectors and I've asked, how are you? How was your weekend? How was your day? Each one's slightly different. So the name of the game with vector databases is how do you find a way to discriminate between how is your day, Helena, and how is your weekend, Helena? I have to make sure we're always looking for that weekend part and trying to find that match so that when I ask, hey, how did all my employees spend their weekend? And I'm going through Helena's profile. It's looking for that keyword of weekend amongst all the noise of the additional vectors that keep popping up over and over again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a great that, That's the best I could do. <laughs> yeah, something yeah, so yeah, that. Mm -hmm. It's a good way to put it. I mean, the way that I describe it is it is a database that turns words into numbers that computers understand and we don't. And then it's able to <laughs> store that and then turn it back into words again. Yes, that's the hyper friendly <laughs> definition. Yeah, sure. I, use, I use my definition because when things go wrong, it's something nice to lean on. This is why it didn't work. Because see this yeah. number, it's very close to this number. So it makes sense that I picked this instead of that. But I like yours better. <laughs> so let's go back to the AI agents. Okay, so you have your, you know, custom GPT as your basic AI agent. How do you take that, you know, one step further, um, as you were mentioning earlier? Sure. So that was like low code. If we want to go custom code, mm -hmm. um, I use a series of open source libraries to create GPTs, but are not beholden to custom GPTs or chat GPT. So there's even a framework that I use called open GPTs, which is like an open framework on GitHub where you can customize an experience very similar to GPTs, but you can throw it anywhere. It could be a link that you serve on your network, could be a link that you embed in a chat bot. Um, if it comes to custom code, I just try to take advantage of things that you're shackled in with custom GPTs. One being but you have a limit of the number of messages you can send in like three hours, which is no bueno for use cases where someone has to talk to it quite a few times to get to what they're looking for. If you're looking for an answer to a question, custom GPT is awesome. If you're looking to iterate with the help of a tool, it is not good because every 30 messages where, you know, you might not be getting exactly what you're looking for, you're going to have to wait three hours to continue. And that's a really bad user experience. So mm -hmm. that's why I try to escape the jail of custom GPTs for those use cases. And I build it fully custom using these frameworks. I build on top of them with my own custom Python. And I use them also for privacy sensitive clients. Uh, if they want to use, let's say, Azure OpenAI, I can do that through open GPTs. Whereas custom GPT, you're always trusting that your data is not going to a malicious place or not being used for training, which nowadays no one has trust in any big tech giant, right? So for sure. That's my strategy. Yeah. So we, with we had that. Go on, oh. Helena, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say we had that exact same conversation on our last podcast and when they were because the guest was uh talking about medical stuff and mm -hmm. yeah, we kind of went through that privacy issue that kind of people aren't really talking about and self hosting um LLMs and kind of using open source as well so 
Yeah. So uh, yeah, very under under uh, discussed topic, I think. Yeah. Absolutely. Wouldn't the the Open GPT um, that you're finding on GitHub still use the Open AI API key? You can customize it. You can make use an open source model. Uh, you can make it use um, Azure Open AI key. So, like you set up an Azure account, you apply for Open AI. It takes one day to get in, and then all that traffic that goes through Azure is encrypted. And the only thing they log are errors, and you can actually call them to opt out of even error logging. So it's a very good way. It's SOC 2 compliant. So it checks a lot of the boxes that for 80% of those sensitive clients, it does facilitate that conversation. Got it. So you would use that to build uh, essentially what OpenAI has for the custom GPTs, but it's all custom. So you just don't have the nice uh, front end too. You know, you yes. like have a lot more control and flexibility. You lose the beauty and you have to stay on top of framework releases. Because one thing with like things like Azure is they change their frameworks all the time and their underlying code will just break one day and you'll have to spend like a day or two fixing it, which is not ideal. It's funner to rely on another service to do that dirty work for you, ideally, if you can avoid it. Mm -hmm. For sure. For sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, definitely. I think, I think with GPTs as well is... Producing for clients, maybe on a, like a low ticket thing. It also has a file, file upload max, doesn't it? Yeah, up so, to ten PDFs. Yeah, so that's also an issue. And like delivering a solution for a client and then sending them to OpenAI or ChatGPT to use it, like yeah, it kind of. I don't know. Really one just to show people like what it could do and what's about yeah it's 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 it is good for it can be good for kind of a prototype if it's like a basic a basic solution but yeah i mean yeah because gpts aren't uh aren't really something that we uh we go into too much like relevance can do all of that plus a lot more and you can deploy to anywhere so yeah, my use case for custom GPTs like got emboldened a week and a half ago when ChatGPT Teams came out because now mm -hmm. you can create a centralized tool for a yeah. team that is already using ChatGPT and you have better privacy there, no logging for the yeah. team. So it's an easier sell that way where you're building internal tools. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. And it's already a tool that they're familiar, uh, familiar with and using already as well, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes like it's the path of least resistance because everyone uses it either low key or high key at every company. And mm -hmm. if everyone has an excuse to use it openly, usually that's well received from certain audiences. For sure. So Mark, where do you see um, AI going in the next 12 months? I know that might be a loaded question. Uh, if I had to get more specific, I would say like what services do you think will really take off like over the next year and where do you see AI going? Um, mm -hmm. Here. I see, and you know, obviously I do a lot of research. I watch a lot of content, so I, I'm on this stuff all the time. I think that OpenAI will create a definition of shallow AGI that it will achieve by September to December of this year. What does that mean in plain English? 40 to 60% of white collar labor, labor will be able to, if you invest the time and energy, to be somewhat automated by the end of the year. That's my prediction the work we have today as it is as it's been for like 20 30 years implication of that from a service perspective i think we'll go from managing chatbots to managing swarms of agents so it'll be like agent swarm services because you'll have tons of agents which are like small employees and you'll need someone to orchestrate them make sure they're all operating as they should making sure that one agent isn't ripping api credits as much as it should be there's going to be a lot of things on maintaining and building swarms that now take over instead of three tasks, 30 tasks. So I, yeah, just go ahead. Back off for a second here. So for people who are just listening and new, maybe new to AI, what is an AI agent swarm? Sure. <laughs> like from the basics here. <laughs> no worries. So AI agent, think of it as an employee. You can now make an AI agent that can help you write a transcript for YouTube. Okay. That's an example of a one agent function. Mm -hmm. Imagine you have another agent that specializes in taking that transcript and turns that transcript from text to video and start making you some very basic, rough like storyboards of what your YouTube video should look like. 
agent number three could take that storyboard and actually create a POC MP4 of like a two minute clip of what your YouTube might be. And you keep going and going and going where you have multiple employees that all specialize in one core component of that workflow. A swarm is many of these where now you don't need that editor. You don't need that video editor. You don't need the writer. You don't need that thumbnail creator. You have different GPTs or agents that specialize in doing those end tasks. Mm -hmm. When they work as a symphony or like as an orchestra, they all work together hand in hand like employees, but unlike employees, they will do what they're told to do 90% of the time. Mm -hmm. They won't take vacation. They won't have uh, emotional breakdowns. They will just do what they need to do all the time. And you will be able to increase your throughput of X task five to 10 times what you can right now, even with the most robust of human teams. Wow. Wow. Yeah, definitely. I was reading something the other day as well, where it said that um, the future of work is is a small team of humans working with a larger team of AI uh, agents, each with a specialized role. Um, just to go back to the AI agents, um, one problem that um, I see some companies are having is uh, like training some of these like um, AI agents to sound less robotic right? Um, it's easy to create these agents, but um, a lot of them just, you know, like outputs from chat GPT, like you can kind of like tell like this just sounds a little off, right? So um, how do you optimize these agents and actually get it to sound like something that company and that brand um, really sound like? Because um, yeah. just with prompts, sometimes you still don't get that result that you're really looking for. Yep. So I have a hack for this that I'm using, which is I get the main point of contact I'm working with mm -hmm. to go on voice memo or anything that records and record themselves talking the way they'd like that agent to conversate. And I will actually, I have a prompt that says like, extract all the lexical features, all the disfluencies. And I actually purposely try to integrate some disfluencies into the AI agent's speaking by chain prompting it so you'll get an output and i'll chain prompt with the imperfect but perfect in a way discourse of the actual human to dumb it down and make it human-like as much as possible so i have like an extra layer that's like my i call it my human layer that's what i do for most clients wow yeah that's that's what we have in our i mean we built in an internal linkedin content generator and that's exactly what that's exactly how i built that out is just take how I write and also how I speak and then use a prompt to be able to turn that into readable uh, tone and uh, kind of the way it talks and then use that within the prompt. So I haven't, uh, I haven't gone down the route of, uh, of getting voice memos from, from clients. That's a, another nugget for sure. But uh, yeah, like using, using those examples uh, and then putting that, into uh chat gpt whatever and then getting it to basically give you that exact tone and style it's it's, it's exactly what we have in our internal kind of content generation uh, yeah. agent as well yeah and for listeners um, who don't know um if we can just back up for a second what is chain prompting cool uh so a prompt is just when you send an instruction or a series of refined instructions to a large language model like chat gpt a chain prompt is just an extra prompt on top of it. It's like a follow through prompt. Why do you use that? Sometimes you want it to do so much in one shot that it can only focus so much of its attention to a portion of that task. Maybe it misses out on a, a detail. Maybe it misses out on that detail nine times out of 10. An extra prompt on top of the response that you receive acts as a sort of a red team to make sure that it always does that one thing it seems to always forget and always integrates it. It kind of takes care of that one part. So you can think of a chain prompt as the most rudimentary version of an agent swarm. If you have four prompts to accomplish the same output, those are technically multiple mini agents that all add a portion to that prompt and that resulting output to get you what you're looking for in terms of that final result. Right. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. My pleasure. <laughs> My pleasure. 
And um, I know, I know everyone always asks us this, so I'll ask you this as well. What are your favorite AI tools to use? Favorite AI tools. Um, so number one is Perplexity AI. I love it because it's really good for research. It's not beholden to Bing, which I've hated my whole life. <laughs> so that's that's a big one. I love that it cites its sources. It's good for market research. Number two, um, I love obviously ChatGPT, um, Relevance AI pretty good when it works uh, when it doesn't work not so good but for the most part it works and then other than that um, yeah typically I use this tool that's escaping my memory right now oh, it's called write sonic it's really good for writing AI blog content if you're trying to improve the SEO of your site and have it directly post directly on your website end to end every day just by giving it one topic it just runs with it and it can run it right up to 1500 words using GPT-4 and it's for a pretty reasonable cost, not to mention that they've now added tons of capabilities to do uh, personal chatbots through that same tool for the same price, all that kind of stuff. So those are my my main go-tos. I mean, yeah, I'm surprised by the right Sonic one. I mean, I've been a user of that for ages. I was doing I was doing the beta testing for when they were doing when they were bringing in the bots. But uh, yeah, it's a uh, Kind of like a Jasper type thing, right? Exactly, exactly. It's just like access to cheap content if you're trying to just get some SEO rankings up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and as, just as we're wrapping up here, where do you see your agency going in, in the next year? Um, and how are you planning to kind of like grow that, you know, over time? Sure. Um, right now it's just you, right? If I'm not mistaken. So funny story. Um, I scaled up to five, six people. And then I ended up going back to me with two agencies that I work with. So I work with two development houses because I've had some experiences where I've had devs that flaked on me mid-project. I didn't get what I was looking for. Vacations come up in the middle of really important deliveries. So I went all the way back to me. And my goal has been and still is, I'm going to, and I'm building, agents to replace what I need in the business for the most part. Um, I'm going to have two development houses that I'll continue to work with to do my big builds for things that involve front end, back end, where like I don't have the time to do it all myself. I'm going to do some medium ticket myself just for cash flow purposes to keep the business going, uh, build a bit of a treasure chest there. And then I'm actively working on how do I automate prompting? How do I automate creating gigs on Fiverr? How do I automate writing invoices and proposals. So I'm trying to find my way to that place. I right now have like three virtual assistants I'm working with until I get there. But uh, that's the plan from a staffing standpoint. From a strategy standpoint, I was working with individuals and in SMBs last year. My goal is higher level startups and SMBs and more enterprises. That's kind of where I'm really focusing on. And that's definitely where the money is. So that's where I'll see myself for the next six, 12 months. Wow. So focusing more on enterprises versus yes. SMBs. Yeah, because I've, I've built enough and I've had enough conversations that I know most of the red tape. So I can usually bring that up pretty proactively now in those conversations. And I'm not as blindsided as I used to be. Mm -hmm. But people just who may, you know, just be starting out and maybe interested in a career in AI, like how are you making these connections and getting into the um, enterprises? Yeah, great question. So obviously, my current lead sources are Fiverr, referrals from people that I've worked with Fiverr in the past that have liked what I've done, mm -hmm. um, people through uh, AAA Discord that I know that have a contact, that have a friend where they uh, have lead that they didn't want, and they want to pass it on. And I've built some good rapport, offered free value or offered good value. So that's really like the, the catalyst there. And I would say, no matter how big the ticket amount is, if you do a really great job and over deliver, your work will speak for itself and someone will feel the need to be indebted to you to tell someone else about your services. So if you build in that way where it's so good, you feel guilty not telling someone else, then that's kind of the ethos that I grow my business by. That's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> awesome. All right, Mike, any last minute questions? No, I'm, I'm, I'm super interested in the, uh, in uh, like, the uh you building out swarms to basically replace all your staff i mean it just makes so much sense absolutely yeah. 
that's I mean, a, putting in, you're, you're putting into action what you're teaching basically hot take this is a super hot take spicy hot take um a year from now venture capital firms will not ask you to look at your team sheet and be confident that you have five people on your team from these industries i think the value of that will plummet and it'll be how many people do you not need to grow the startup it will be a flex to say i'm a solopreneur instead of oh, we can't just have you be a solopreneur. We need you to have a co-founder. We need you to have a CFO. We need you to have a CTO. I think the tables will shift very quickly because they'll see the lack of headcount as an opportunity to de-risk their investments. So I'm looking forward to that. And I'm like, I'm going to start that now because I might sell my agency three to four years from now. And my biggest value prop is I'm the only employee. And don't worry about branding. I have, I've outgrown myself in branding through my agents.